at a time where we didn't have any imaging or randomized controlled trials, people were able to observe the body and manipulate it through different breathing techniques and postures. And they even figured out how to keep themselves alive in the freezing cold. And we can continue to replicate this. Hello, welcome to Breath, the new science of a lost art expert Q&A. We're here talking about stress and chronic pain and breathing. And we are joined by Dr. Deepti Agarwal, who is an anesthesiologist and pain management specialist at Northwestern Lake Forest Hospital in the Chicagoland area. She's been studying how integrative medicine can influence chronic pain in the progression of disease for more than 10 years. And she's here to tell us about the why, the what, and how of breathing for these conditions and more. The first reader question is from Ed. He says, I'm wondering if there is any particular breathing technique that has been found to be especially good at diffusing stress. Dr. Agarwal. So just to reiterate a few things that we know, breathing is one of the few biological functions that can be performed both voluntarily and involuntarily. So by regulating our breath consciously, not only do we influence how we're responding to our outside, but we're also profoundly influencing our internal physiology. In terms of stress, our nervous system is bounced around all day. We're, we're on autopilot responding to different stimuli. And many of us live in this chronically overactive fight or flight um, you know, response. And we kind of have this underactive rest and relax response. So that's our sympathetic versus parasympathetic. So over time, that repeated firing causes abnormalities in what's called the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal, which are three organs that are release our stress hormones. So this abnormality in the axis eventually disrupts homeostasis and balance in our body and leads to a whole cascade of events that we're not even aware of. It increases our blood glucose, increases inflammatory factors, and ultimately leads to a lot of lifestyle diseases that people have questions about. So breathing is what serves as a portal through which we can correct some of those imbalances in the stress response system. In terms of the breathing techniques, slow, deep breathing techniques that focus on long breath retention are thought to stimulate the vagus nerve, decrease our metabolic needs, and produce sort of the physiological effects of being in a relaxed parasympathetic state. Can you lead us through a real quick technique that can help diffuse stress? So I think for the purposes of this video and something that's easy for people to start with is basic box breathing, which some, some people may have heard of, which is basically to start with inhaling through the nose for four breaths, holding it for four breaths, exhaling for four breaths, pausing before you repeat that. And I think getting used to just inhaling and exhaling in that way is a good start. And over time, people can practice a longer inhalation, longer breath retention, longer exhalation. So the next question from Kelly, I have fibromyalgia and I'm having a hard time dealing with it. It seems to be getting worse. Is there anything breathing can do? So fibromyalgia is a challenging medical issue to deal with as a patient and also challenging as a physician to diagnose. It's painful, patients experience poor sleep, chronic fatigue, and actually, this is a common issue among most pain conditions. Um, so sometimes in the more musculoskeletal issues, it's hard to know which comes first. Is it the pain or is it the poor sleep and fatigue that causes the pain? It's sort of this tug of war. And I think as you pointed out in your book, we need to think of breathing in two ways here. Improving our breathing patterns can help the body to relax and heal, detoxify, increase our immunity, Suboptimal breathing patterns can lead to chronic, chronic fatigue and pain. And I think as physicians, we don't necessarily discuss or even evaluate patients for suboptimal or dysfunctional breathing. And this could be the cause of people's musculoskeletal issues. So I think that's really important um, that we pay attention to this. But again, the best way that breathing techniques can help with these sorts of issues is to ameliorate the stress response in the body. 
Um, this is gonna help blunt the pain response, help improve, improve people's mood, help them better able to cope with the issues at hand as well. Next question from Wilson. Is there a breathing technique that can help with burnout? Burnout in society as a whole is a big problem. Balance in our daily life has always been a, an issue, especially here in the Western world and especially heightened during this pandemic. So I, th I think this ends up becoming a little bit of a lifestyle negotiation and we need to find strategies as individuals to make everyday restorative. Effectively, we have to find ways to operate within the system that we live in. So within our culture, navigating our work life, and what better way than to access a tool that's available to us all the time. And that would be with just starting a breathing practice. It, there's not a particular you know, breathing technique that's going to help us. We, there's a myriad of techniques available, but just even committing to a technique is very helpful. And there's no literature review or in-depth lecture that's going to do justice for it. You just have to experience it yourself. And I'm sure you would agree. I would agree. The next question from Ian Levitt from France. I have a query concerning my arthritis, especially gout. I was wondering whether doing deep breathing practices such as the Wim Hof method could lower my pH levels and turn my uric acid levels lower. What would the science suggest? So the Wim Hof method is a fairly aggressive pranayama or breathing technique. It's breathing plus immersion in ice baths. And, and the purpose of that is it's cold therapy. It's an anti-inflammatory for the body. Um, and it's, but it is fairly progressive with the types of studies that they've conducted. It's not for the faint hearted. Um, the point of this technique is really to put your body in a state of hormesis, which is basically giving your body an intermittent stressor that is beneficial to you. So that's like you know, extra, physical exercise, you exert yourself, um, but not enough to harm yourself. And so it's like, it gives your body that grit. Now, for those people that don't know what is gout, it's an inflammatory arthritis where there's a buildup of uric acid crystals and that causes a lot of pain in our joints. So should you do Wim Hof for that? Sure, if you are up for it and physically able to, it's not likely to harm you. Can I guarantee that it will eradicate your gout? No. Can I say that it will most likely help you in some way? Yes. Um, you know, a lot of this has to also do with external life, lifestyle factors. If you're drinking a six pack of beer and doing Wim Hof, you're not gonna get the results that you're looking for. Um, in terms of can Wim Hof lower your pH, from what I understand, the magic in the method is not necessarily to lower your pH, it's to produce a slight respiratory alkalosis, which actually increases your pH. Um, but as far as Wim Hof has studied, he has shown benefits in inflammatory arthritic conditions. They're not huge trials. But I think even, you know, having an N of 20 to 30 is really helpful to get uh, this on the map, these types of techniques to help with inflammatory pain conditions. Next question from Mary. My husband suffers from Raynaud syndrome, where his fingers and toes go white when he's cold. Is there any way to breathe that can increase circulation into the extremities and help relieve the syndrome? Okay, so what is Raynaud's? It's basically a problem that causes decreased blood flow to the fingers and toes, um, causing them to get pale, tingle. Uh, the mechanism is thought to be a sort of a spasm in the blood vessel. Usually happens in response to cold stress or some sort of emotional upset. Um, and Raynaud's is interesting because it can cause symptoms in both, temperatures ex both temperature extremes. So again, what precipitates this issue is thought to be some sort of stressor. And as we've discussed, breathing can decrease our stress burden. Does it specifically decrease the spasm or narrowing of the blood vessels associated with this disease? We actually don't know all the exact cellular cascade of events yet that breathing influences. I would say it's hard to label what breathing technique works for what disease. 
I think it's important to understand that this is an overall vitality enhancing practice. We have evidence that it increases immunity, enhances our cardiovascular fitness, helps prevent disease progression, and makes us more happy. So I would advocate that most breathing techniques in general are very useful. For this particular situation, I think a mix of slow pranayama and fast pranayama could prove to be helpful because we can really detoxify and get the circulation moving. And even you know, mixing in a few yoga postures is really helpful for circulation. So a combination of the two is definitely gonna help. When you say detoxifying, what exactly do you mean? So by detoxifying, I mean, you're doing such a cleansing in your body that the idea is, is if there's any stagnant energy, it's flowing through, getting rid of free oxygen radicals. Okay. Um, the next question here is from Henry. And he says, which breathing methods are most effective at increasing lung capacity? So that's a good question. In general, all deep breathing techniques that we discuss are meant to increase lung capacity. Um, lung volume and capacity are important measures in medicine as predictors of health and help us gauge the severity of lung disease. And we have tests that help us evaluate how much we're breathing in and out. So to simplify, if you think about a pair of lungs that is fully inflated in an average 70 kilogram adult, that comes out to be about six liters, can hold about six liters. And that's called our total lung capacity. The amount of air that moves in and out during the lungs when we're just you know, doing quiet breathing is called the tidal volume, and that's half a liter. Then we have a value that's called the inspiratory reserve volume, which is basically the amount of air that we can inhale if we put all of our effort into it. And this is above the normal tidal volume that we use while we're breathing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's three liters. So if you do the math, we actually have the three liters plus the half a liter. And, and that's way more than the half a liter that we're normally using to breathe. So we have the capacity to inhale way above normal breaths. And let's also not forget that it's not just about lung capacity. Breathing techniques serve to condition your lungs. It's like a workout for the lungs. You know, the more birthdays we have, our airways, our blood vessels, our muscles around the lungs tend to get stiff and we want to keep them conditioned so that they don't get atrophied and smaller. Um, it's also important to notice that even the pharyngeal muscles that we have up here, we tone them when we engage in deeper breathing exercises. And over time, those are, those are the muscles which lose slack and cause issues like the snoring and sleep apnea, which you've eloquently described in your book. From Carla, what's the best way to breathe to help relieve high blood pressure? So again, many of the studies done on pranayama and breathing techniques conclude that consciously controlling our breath in a slow and controlled way shifts our body into a parasympathetic dominance. And this influences a lot of our cardiovascular parameters, namely the heart rate and blood pressure to lower them. This is all still being studied, but there's even studies to suggest that a mix of pranayama plus some yoga postures have parallels to the way statin therapies work in our body to lower lipids. So I find that pretty interesting because the statins, you know, are known to produce nitric oxide, decrease inflammatory biomarkers in our blood and slow the progression of plaque buildup in our arteries. And so, there are links, we just haven't been able to clearly elucidate all of them. But in general, slow breathing techniques are good for blood pressure control. And the last question is from me. You work in a hospital, you work within the medical community. Why aren't more doctors talking about this stuff? Well, in my utopian hospital, they would be. Um, but I think it comes down to a few things. Number one is awareness, for sure. We still operate in an allopathic medical system that is driven by systematic research, 
And a lot of these methods are just not advocated for in mainstream medical journals. But I think, you know, we shouldn't forget that good medicine is based in good science, but it's still inquiry driven and it's open to new paradigms. So with time, physician and patient awareness will increase. And I think that your book is a great start to get people interested and also sort of tell them the history and anthropology behind all of this. I'm also a big believer in experiential evidence. So at a time where we didn't have any imaging or randomized controlled trials, people were able to observe the body and manipulate it through different breathing techniques and postures. And they even figured out how to keep themselves alive in the freezing cold. And we can continue to replicate this. So we can't discount this evidence. And I think there's some value and, and I'm only mentioning it for those that are truly um, data-driven. The other thing is, is I think we have to accept disevolution, which you also discussed. A lot of the medicine we practice is treatment driven and the broader concepts of health promotion and the prevention of illness are lost, which sort of leads me to the, the point of accountability too. I think people have to want to take control of their health enough to actually do it. And breathing is something that can be done when you're healthy or sick. So it's, everyone should be doing it. And you know, we're all in this together. It's not me as a physician telling someone to, to, to do it. We all share that same plight. Um, and the last thing that I think is important is accessibility. What I would like to see happen over time is that some of these basic wellness, wellness techniques are advocated on a more routine basis when you go see your general practitioner. Um, one day we may even see protocols at hospitals that patients can participate in and what would be even more amazing is if we can start this when you know people are young as children because that's where some of these chronic problems pop up the asthma the allergies rise in anxiety um, help kids with good respiratory endurance to run track swim do all the sports that they like to do too uh, but i think that what happens is the wellness industry it, it's soaring in this country and obviously people are interested but everything that becomes sort of popular in the West ends up having a high price tag and it doesn't need to, like these practices are inaccess or, sorry, inexpensive and very accessible to you. I would say, you know, it's helpful to have someone guide you through a few basic breathing techniques before you get started. Uh, but other than that, these are things that over time and with practice, everyone can pick up. Dr. Deepti Agarwal, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.